Hello, I'm Nick Gowing. Welcome to Cadogan Hall in London for an Intelligence Squared debate on one of the most contentious issues in European politics, that the policies of German Chancellor Angela Merkel are destroying Europe. No one blames Germany for the 2008 global financial crisis, but many argue that Chancellor Merkel's insistence on severe spending cuts and enforced deficit reductions in countries like Greece, Portugal and Spain have really threatened the stability both of the European Union and the Eurozone. So, the motion for debate here, Angela Merkel is destroying Europe. And we have an excellent panel for you. Arguing for the motion, Mehdi Hassan, political director of the Huffington Post UK. He's the author of a book on austerity myths, The Debt Delusion. And Euclid Tsakolotos from Greece, a member of parliament for the Syriza party, economic advisor to Alexis Tsipiras, who is the party leader. Against the motion, Christine Ockrent, a prominent voice in the French media, former head of France 24 and Radio France Internationale, and former editor-in-chief of the weekly news magazine L'Express. And Anthony Beaver, award-winning historian of the 20th century. Ladies and gentlemen, our panel. Well, shortly you'll hear uh, from the four panelists, two for the motion, two against. The debate will then be thrown open to the floor. The audience was polled before the debate. I'll give you details of that after we've heard from each of our speakers. The audience will then vote again to see how opinion has changed. Now, the opening statements from the panelists. Let's uh, hear, first of all, speaking for the motion, Mehdi Hassan as well as being political director of the Huffington Post in the UK. He is biographer of Labour leader Ed Miliband and the author of an e-book on austerity myths. Mehdi Hassan, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I'm here, we're here, to persuade you all that Chancellor Angela Merkel of Germany is destroying Europe. But let's be very clear before we go any further as to what this debate is not. Number one, this is not a debate about Angela Merkel per se. The proposition is not here tonight to attack her as a person, but only to attack, to critique, to reject her destructive policies, and by extension, I should add, the policies of pretty much the entire German establishment. Number two, when we say Germany or Merkel is, quote, destroying Europe, we're referring to the very visible, very undeniable damage being done to the economic and social fabric of countries such as Greece, Spain, Portugal, Ireland. And number three, this isn't a debate where we say Germany has no right to pursue its national interest. Of course not. Of course it does. But the question remains, is Germany's unflinching, unrelenting, all-consuming pursuit of its own national interest at all costs destroying the rest of Europe, particularly Southern Europe. We believe it is. How so? Well, primarily through austerity, misguided, self-defeating austerity. Merkel and Germany's preferred solution to Europe's growth, debt and jobs crises, i.e. cuts, cuts and more cuts, has brought the continent to the edge of a second Great Depression. And today, under Merkel, Germany, for so long the driving force of Europe's growth, prosperity, unity, now finds itself isolated once again, loathed and feared in equal measure. Merkel did not cause Europe's financial crisis. That dishonor still belongs to the world's top bankers. But her deficit fetishism, her Hooveresque obsession with balanced budgets and severe spending cuts helped produce the Eurozone's longest ever recession and continues to threaten to disrupt six decades of pan-European stability and unity. As we shall see tonight, her supporters argue that this is totally unfair. The Iron Chancellor, they believe, is standing up for hard-working Germans who are weary of having to bail out their feckless and profligate southern European neighbours. But this argument, ladies and gentlemen, is utter, utter nonsense. Fecklessness? Figures compiled by the OECD show that, on average, the lazy Greek worker labors for 2,000 hours a year, which is more than 40% longer than the average German does. So a little less schadenfreude, please. And as for profligacy, despite what Frau Merkel and her friends would have you believe, it has little to do with Europe's current crisis. Spain's downturn was caused not by excessive government spending or public debt, 
but by the wholly unsustainable growth in private debt, particularly in the financial, real estate and insurance sectors. Thanks to the crash, Spain went from having one of the lowest public debt to GDP ratios in the entire Eurozone to one of the highest. So let's junk this overspending myth too. In fact, it's underspending. It's Merkel prescribed austerity that is to blame for the current growth crisis, or I should say lack of growth crisis. The results are in. Austerity isn't working, it has failed. In September, the unemployment rate in the Eurozone hit a record high of 12.2%. That's 20 million people. The situation for young people, meanwhile, is beyond dire. It's heartbreaking. Youth unemployment stands up 35% in Portugal. A mind-boggling 56% in Spain, a whopping 61% in Greece. This is a human tragedy, plain and simple. It's the willful destruction, yes, destruction, of an entire European generation. But Merkel won't budge. She's the chief purveyor of the very conventional wisdom that says an economy is like a household. It shouldn't spend or borrow beyond what it earns. But economies are not households, or credit cards for that matter. And common sense, if not basic macroeconomic theory, tells us that the solution to a downturn caused by a drought in demand is not to cut demand further by everyone slashing spending at once. History teaches us that the Great Depression wasn't helped by US President Herbert Hoover's austerity measures. And in pre-war Germany, it was mass unemployment, not hyperinflation, that propelled Hitler to power. Isn't it ironic? that the leader of a nation understandably paranoid about and offended by any mention of its Nazi past seems so relaxed about the rise in recent years of anti-austerity, neo-Nazi, far-right parties across Europe, from Marine Le Pen's National Front to Greece's black-shirted Golden Dawn to the fascists of Jobbik, now the third largest party in Hungary. Merkel, however, prefers to fiddle, not just as Athens burns, but Madrid and Lisbon and, yes, Rome too. Ladies and gentlemen, in denial, indifferent to human suffering, bent on austerity at all costs, Angela Merkel is destroying the European project, pauperizing her neighbors, and risking a new continent-wide, if not global, Great Depression. She must be stopped. She must be sent a message. Ladies and gentlemen, I urge you to vote yes tonight. Send that message tonight. I beg to propose. Thank you very much. Mehdi Hassan, thank you very much indeed. Now let's move to the first speaker against the motion, Christine Ockrent, a distinguished French journalist who writes for the International New York Times, El País, The Guardian, and other European newspapers. Thank you, Nick. I will try and convince you that all the very good arguments of this very eloquent young man are misled. Angela Merkel is not destroying Europe. Of course, Angela Merkel is not perfect. There's no perfect leader. Do you know of any? We might need one on the other side of the channel. <laughs> the truth is that Angela Merkel is the head of a strong parliamentary democracy with checks and balances which were imposed upon Germany, very strict ones, by the British and the American victors after World War II. She is no whimsical, temperamental, bloodthirsty Kaiser marching upon Europe. She has been re-elected three times by German citizens, which tends to show that they appreciate her leadership. She does not actually dictate the policies of Europe, not even the policies of the Eurozone, for the very simple reason that there is no common economic policy of the Eurozone, which, by the way, is part of its problem. The truth of the matter is that Angela Merkel has been skilled enough to maintain and indeed amplify the policies of her social democrat predecessor, Gerhard Schroeder, and the uh, 2010 agenda at the time where Germany was actually nicknamed the sick man of Europe. And indeed, through very harsh sacrifice and labor and all sorts of agreements which the trade unions agreed upon, the self-discipline of the Germans have indeed made it so that today Germany is the strongest kid in the bloc. Now, that may not be comfortable for all of us, especially on the continent, but still it is a fact. Angela Merkel is not responsible for the disastrous policies which have been ruining 
Southern Europe, galloping deficits, collapse of competitiveness, real estate bubbles, banking system failed, and the cheating on economic figures to join the Euro. Spain, Portugal, Italy for other reasons, Greece, who are the responsible people? Not Merkel, but those incompetent, myopic, if not corrupt elites, which have government after government, and especially in Greece, led their countries into this kind of abyss. Of course, Merkel can be irritating, you know, with her sermon, preaching austerity, probably the same way her father was using the Bible in East Germany, trying to fight over communism. But indeed, what she expresses is common sense. It is true that all of us, all of you, reasonable people, we cannot spend that much more than what we actually make. It just doesn't make sense. Of course, the Eurozone is incomplete, if not a faulty system, because it bonds together creditor countries from the north, which have to support debtor countries in the south. I personally hope that now that Merkel has been re-elected, there will indeed be a minimum wage in Germany, and that will be quite a revolution. There will indeed be an increase in domestic demand, and that will help the weaker state uh, within the European Union. There needs to be better mechanisms also to strengthen the Eurozone, but we on the continent, we know that the euro is a political project and not only an economic and monetary one, that it's been faulted from the start, it needs to be strengthened, and within that framework, indeed, Germany will be, again, the engine of Europe, assuming, of course, there is more cooperation and more solidarity between us. So, my last argument to convince you, ladies and gentlemen, that indeed Merkel is not destroying Europe. What has destroyed Europe are again irresponsible and myopic governments, which have now been dismissed by their people, to the great uh, uh, ballooning of the extreme right in these countries, I stress the fact that Germany has no extreme right. And so I think the fact that there is now recovery showing up, timidly but still, in Spain and even in Greece, is a good omen for the times to come. Thank you. Christian Ockren, thank you very much indeed. Our sp first speaker against the motion. Now, Euclid Takalotos, who is uh, an economics professor, uh, an MP for the left-wing uh, Syriza party in Greece, strongly opposes the government's austerity measures, co-authored a recent book, Crucible of Resistance, Greece, the Eurozone, and the World Economic Crisis. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nick. 60 years ago, in this very city in London, Germany came here after the war and got the following deal. Firstly, a haircut of her debt. Secondly, the Marshall Plan, a huge investment plan. And thirdly, a condition that she would only pay back the bit of the debt that wasn't cut if she had good economic performance in terms of exports and growth. So what was decided in London 60 years ago? That there would be no return to the interwar period that there would be no return to the recession. Germany would not be punished for the Second World War. We would not have a debt trap again. And we laid the foundations for the golden age of capitalism, of the welfare state, of social security. I will be very interested to hear from a historian of the Second World War why Germany was rightly not punished in 1953, but Greece should have been punished in 2010. Let me go back to the beginnings. How did we get into this crisis? We got into the crisis because people believed neoliberal rhetoric. They believed that if you liberalized everything, there would be growth, and everybody was told, borrow, because we'll have so much growth, you'll be able to pay it back. So they said to people, to firms, to households, to banks, to states, borrow. 
And when that didn't happen, when we didn't have that growth, and then when we had a crisis, what happened? Well, we had to discuss which contracts could we keep after the crisis. And what did Merkel impose on Europe and impose on Greece that only one contract we, would we keep? The contract to debtors, to borrowers, to the people who'd lent to us. No other social contract. Not to our ill people who we promised that if you work hard, the state will be there to protect you. Not to, your, to our pensioners where we promised that if you worked hard, the state would be there to help you in your pension. Not to our young people that we said if you educate yourself, if you go to universities, there'll be a job for there. All those social contracts have been broken. They've been broken because Greece, Spain and Portugal have created a state that accept only one obligation to their creditors. Is that a future for Europe? Greece is, and now I'm appealing to your hearts as well as to your minds, because all these social contracts are broken, is facing a humanitarian crisis. I won't milk this, I won't tell you very many examples, but think of the lady who has to give up her cancer treatment. Think of a lighter example, a small accumulation, the granny who can't this year give any presents to the grandchildren. Think of that, what that does to a society, how people react into that in that society. We've been here before. We oppose Merkel and we're struggling for a new democratic Europe because we know what happened when progressive alternatives failed in the 1930s. We know that there are always generals on white horses who are ready to come into the vacuum left by politicians who have abandoned every agenda on pensions, on wages, on the welfare state. I'm telling you that opposing Merkel is important, not just because of what she's doing, but what space she's creating for those generals and white horses. And we can start here together and say, and now I'm speaking more as an economist, as a professor rather than a politician, there is no law of social science that says that neoliberal capitalism is the only game in town. There is no economics law that says only the private sector and the market can respond to people's needs. The inequality within Western countries cannot last for much longer. The poverty in Western economies cannot last much longer. And if we do not do something as we didn't do with Spain in 1936 and the failure in France in 1936, we know what the results were. The results were fascism and war. And we're close to that again. Bad things happen not only when bad people do them, but when good people don't stand up and stop them. Thank you very much. Euclid Sakalotos, thank you very much indeed. You've now heard the two main speakers for the motion. Now the second speaker against the motion. Anthony Beaver, award-winning historian. His latest book is the number one international bestseller, The Second World War. Anthony Beaver, the floor is yours. It is not Angela Merkel who is destroying Europe. It is the Euro system. Instead of accelerating the unification of the continent as hoped, the experience has divided it, and divided it with bitterness. Let us remember the background to the euro. It stemmed from German unification. France was afraid of the power of a greatly enlarged Germany. And the deal was that German power would be locked up within the European Union and a common currency. This led to the Treaty of Maastricht, and Germany, with grave misgivings at the time, agreed to give up the Deutschmark to accept the euro. It is totally wrong to blame Merkel when the fault always lay with the Euro system itself. You simply cannot expect to have a stable form of monetary union between independent nations which have huge differences in productivity. In fact, it is the one-size-fits-all basis of the Euro system, with no debtor country able to devalue or raise or lower interest rates, which makes the problem impossible to resolve. To have attempted monetary union before political union was madness, but the true believers were far too carried away by their dream. Or in the case of France, with the idea of the euro rivaling the United States dollar and of a united Europe challenging American power. 
European bankers even failed to see the dangers when Club Med countries began a borrowing and spending spree, something which they would never have been able to do with the lira, peseta, or drachma. Germany, as it turned out, has certainly profited from the imbalance in productivity. But German taxpayers, after many years of austerity and pay restraint at home to deal with the immense costs of unification in their own country, never imagined that the European Central Bank would have to rescue other countries from their recklessness. Did nobody in Athens, Rome, Madrid, and Lisbon ever sit down to work out how they were going to pay it back? Or did they just think that those who'd lent them the money uh, would simply go away and forget about it? Like most Germans, Angela Merkel believes in thrift, saving, and hard work. She is no autocrat. She knows that she has to carry, carry her country with her. The European Union is still very far from becoming a reality, and Germany remains a sovereign state. So Merkel, although enjoying great popularity at home, still has to be seen to wear the armor of national interest. This is at a time when the majority of Germans are becoming increasingly reluctant to subsidize countries which got themselves into trouble through insane levels of spending. Meanwhile, the Germans, who, as I said, had been reluctant anyway at the time to abandon the Deutschmark, were promised that no member country would be responsible for the debt of others. That supposedly meant no bailouts. The question is, how long can Europe continue to provide bailouts without the reforms essential to restoring economic competitiveness? Even France, the second largest economy in the Eurozone, might be uh, having to join the Club Med countries as its uncompetitive economy declines disastrously. The Euro crisis has often been described as the longest train crash in history, and there is little chance of it being solved in its present form. Angela Merkel is also deeply troubled by Europe's increasing inability to pay for its expensive ways. She recently emphasized, I quote, Europe accounts for just over 7% of the world's population, 25% of its economy, and 50% of total world welfare spending. In other words, Europe is outspending the rest of the world by roughly seven to one in welfare per head of population. If Europe cannot compete with the outside world, it will soon not be able to pay for any social services at all. As I say, it is not Angela Merkel you should blame. It is the Euro system itself which is tearing Europe apart. If Spain had stuck with the peseta, Italy with the lira, and Greece with the drachma, none of this would have happened. Thank you. Anthony Beaver, thank you very much indeed. We've now heard two for the motion, two against the motion. In a moment, it's for you to contribute to this debate, whether for or against or sitting on the fence. How are you thinking when you came into this hall uh, a short time ago? Well, let me share with you uh, the ballot as you came in. 29% haven't made up their mind. 18% believe she is destroying Europe. 53% of you don't believe she is. So on your side, you have a lot of work to do <laughs> to persuade the 29% to move one way or the other. Or it could be that you've got to do a bit of persuading as well to keep those on your side. Right, we have six microphones. I'm going right to the back first. My name is Robert Walvis. I'm a Dutchman. I have voted against the motion. My question to the panel is, why should hardworking Northern Europeans pay for, say, the Greeks, who have for years not, able, not been able to collect the taxes from their own elites, many of whom live in London houses. We'll come to that in a moment. Right, uh, down here at the front, the young man has the uh, microphone. Hi there, I voted um, for the motion at the beginning. If we've got such a large debt to pay off and then a deficit to, to balance, a budget to balance, why are we looking to get that money from the poor? Because by definition, the poor don't have that much money. So we wouldn't, it, it's, it's not an effective way of paying off the debt. Surely you should be getting the money from people who have most. Thank you. Right, uh, who has the microphone, please? Stand up. 
Hi, uh, my name's James Ward, and I'm strongly for the motion. Uh, you talk about Germany's ability to restore its competitiveness from being the sick man of Europe. It did this in an environment where there was quite high inflation around Europe, so it was able to restore its competitiveness without deflation. Germany is rigidly against inflation, which means that for the southern economies to regain competitive themselves, they have to have deflation. That's just a mathematical reality. That is extremely bad, and I think that's one of the biggest problems with Merkel sticking in the euro and expecting austerity. Right. Uh, first of all, Euclid, uh, that question about um, why should Europeans uh, keep bailing out the Greeks? Well, there's a flip answer to that. Why should Greeks bail out northern banks? Because that's what they did. And that's what the programme did. The programme was structured so that northern banks in France and Germany could offload their debt and not create the crisis. But there's a more serious and less flip answer to the question. The West has a common problem, and that common problem is in the last 20 years of neoliberalism, they haven't been able to spread the goodies. They haven't been able to encompass some elements of the middle class and the lower classes. And what did they do in America and Britain? They lent to them. The junk bonds were loans to the poorest Americans, and that created a crisis through private debt. I in, think in that Venice, is nuisance. Let me finish. And in Greece, they did it through public debt. Neoliberalism failed. The, the level of medium income, the standards of living, have thoroughly improved in Europe, including in Greece. And again, I fully agree with the Dutch gentleman if your elites had, a, had been a, a little bit more responsible, hadn't fled with capital abroad, I don't go for the that conspiracy. There's something were wonderful the about the Mediterranean, the but very tiresome in Greece. It's the conspiracy theory. It's always a conspiracy. It's always, oh, it's these Nordic banks. All banks make a profit, including some Greek banks, the not phrase, all. The, the phrase from Christian Ockrand earlier was incompetent, myopic, if not corrupt elites. The, the banking system we have now isn't even capitalism. No, that particular point. Yeah, um, it's when they make myopic, if not I am speaking elites. about the elites of the banking sector, who, when they were making I'm money, kept their the money, and now that they're not making money, want us to socialise them. That is the myopic. That is the elite that is irresponsible, and we should treat them. Can I respond to this gentleman at the back, the, the, the guy who made the question? I mean, two points very, very quickly. Number one, this whole dynamic, and I mentioned in my speech about hard-working northerners, lazy fecklers, this whole divisive rhetoric is part of the reason why Merkel is destroying Europe, because the European project is breaking down around these kind of crude stereotypes and weird empirically free ill feelings towards one it's another. It's not lazy I'm, southerners, well, it's failed states. But That's Merkel's right. response to the currency union crisis is what's exacerbated this problem. It's what's taken Greece from, what, three years ago? How many, how many quarters of contraction? 20, 22 mm -hmm. consecutive quarters of contraction, yes, thanks what, to what austerity the, imposed by Germany. Right. No, but what about the origins of the problem? I mean, there was also insane government spending. You've only got to see what was being done in Greece during the course of the but Olympics. And in Spain, too. It's a good thing we have a historian of conflict up here. <laughs> right. Uh, there's that one particular question from the young gentleman down here for you, mm. Anthony. I would actually agree with Euclid on one particular point. We are facing a fundamental crisis, if you like, in the whole system of capitalism from the point of view that in the past, capitalism was always making people, even at the bottom of the um, pile, if you like, richer or slightly better off than they were before. That is no longer, the, no longer the case. And the reason for that has got nothing to do with banks, or it has only in the sense that it is an inevitable process of globalization. Once you have the possibility of sourcing labor all around the world, you will then get this appalling polarization of um, rich and poor in that particular way. And I don't think there's any way of putting the genie back in the bottle. Right. Let's uh, now move on. I want to see those again. So I'm coming to you in a moment. Uh, there are some ladies down here. One, you have the microphone, I hope, and a second behind you, please. Okay. So Imke Henkel, I'm a German journalist living in Britain for 15 years now. So, um, I voted against the motion. I'm still against the motion. But actually, do you see me in the peculiar situation that I very much agree with what Professor Zoccolato said and partly with what Anthony Beaver <laughs> said as well? All of you are mostly um, arguing from a position that was true during um, 2012, but it's not true anymore because German politics has changed and has remarkably changed. And the reason the euro has not collapsed is actually that Merkel is now conjuring 
the austerity policy that is done by the German Bundesbank, which right. is the All right. right culprit through the ECB. The ECB is, is actually spending and is doing the opposite from austerity. Thank you. So and I'd like to encourage more Germans, more Spaniards, more Greeks, more Portuguese, anyone any from any country. In the audience? <laughs> right. Uh, who else has got the microphone, please? We're going up is, to is the balcony now? now. Yes, please. I'm Greek. I'm reluctantly against the motion. To Professor Tsagalatos, may I ask you, to what extent have those politicians and those people in positions of governance taken a hit? And Mr. Hassan, when you mention dignity being lost in Greece, how does that compare to the dignity that is often lost in a third world country? Thank you. The lady in the middle has got the microphone. Hello, my name is Rafaela Evans. I'm French, Canadian, and American. And I am against the motion before and still. And my point is, it seems these Club Med countries are mostly macho countries. Um, does that point out to the fact that maybe we need more women on the board, in the boardrooms and in governments? Um, thank you. Thank you. I, I try and keep it short. Um, I'm German. I've lived here for four, more than 40 years. <clears throat> uh, I consider myself a European. I'm against the motion. I, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Hassan mentioned Hitler in his speech. Uh, I object to that, particularly in connection with Mrs. Merkel. <clears throat> okay, and um, I, you mentioned several times how many hours the Greeks work. It is not the hours you work that counts, but what you produce in those hours. I specifically said that I'm not comparing Angela Merkel to Hitler, and I made a reference to the point about the history and the far-right parties. So you're misquoting me there on that. Christine Ockrent. No, I agree that Hassan did not make the Hitler comparison. Thank God. Right. Uh... <laughs> Who has got the microphone? Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Martin Viol. I'm also a German living in the UK. Um, I originally voted against the motion, um, given the fact that both Mr. Hassan and Mr. Beaver pointed out that maybe the euro is the problem. I'm kind of becoming undecided. So the question is, can I ask the panel, should the euro be abolished, or should the eurozone move towards a political union? Thank you. Uh, Right, let's move up uh, to the balcony on my left. The floor is yours, please. I think part of the problem uh, with the motion in favour is that they really haven't said where the money should come from. There is a sense that money just <laughs> grows on trees and automatically it will be produced. The problem with a European debt crisis is that there is no money in the system to really bail these countries out. Okay, thank you. The second, sorry, the no. second point, if I may, regarding banks, banks have taken an important haircut in terms of absorbing part of the debt. And in the cases where this has not been applied, the situation has been much more disastrous, which is the case of Cyprus. It's always forgotten that in Cyprus, the banks were forced to basically accept all the debts and the whole system went bust. And the criticism right. was done on the other side. On the balcony on the right-hand side as I'm looking up, please. Thank you. Chris Paul, Londoner, against, still against. Would those for the motion explain how they would develop an economy where people borrow and don't have to pay back the debt? Thank you. <laughs> right. Let me put that very important point from up on the balcony. Uh, where should the money come from, you who are speaking for the motion? Well, there are three ways of reducing debt, yeah, for the, and we know the three ways. There's one way having a, a haircut, the other way is to inflate it, and the other way is not to ever pay it back. America never paid its debt, its Second World War debt, because it just grew out of it. All the arguments we're hearing from people who are in, uh, against the motion, we've been through this before. If you make a country fall on its knees, its income goes down, and you never get money back. 
That's the bottom line. That's what happened in the 1930s. All these arguments were used in the 1930s of people have to cut, we have to reduce wages, we have to reduce government expenditure. And it doesn't work. It didn't work in the 1930s, and it's not working now. I think the, there is a key question which was asked by the audience about the Eurozone. Should the Euro be skipped? Uh, and it's a paradox, of course, but that my co-panelist is of an opposite opinion than mine. Mm -hmm. The Eurozone is a political project which has had its good sides and very bad sides, I agree. Anthony Beaver is right that it was conceived as a, as a political scheme but without the institutional uh, framework to make it work. The crisis since 2008 has been so acute and the measures of our government so timid that now I think the time has come for the Eurozone to be strengthened. But as far as the Euro is concerned, just imagine what it would be if each of our countries would have to go back to their national currency. It would be a total collapse of our economics. The, the Deutsche Mark would go up to such a degree that it would, in fact, curtail the German economy and it would do no good at all. Anthony. And other mm -hmm. currencies would collapse. Well, no, I wanted to go back to um, Euclid's um, remark earlier, and he, in fact he posed the question um, about Germany being forgiven its debts after um, in the early 50s and all the rest of it. Um, that, of course, was purely a political decision during the Cold War of restoring um, Germany. That's certainly true, and there were huge political, geopolitical um, aspects behind it. So I don't think you can necessarily compare it with it the whole question. It worked. Yes, the it, German economic miracle, it didn't have m morality tales about Americans are much more productive and why should we support you? They did it and it worked. And why won't it work this time? You haven't oh, answered that and question. And why did it work so much better with Germany rather than with France? And the reason was that the Germans were working incredibly hard. Yeah. You can see the reports of the American occupation forces on the differences between what was happening in France and what was happening in Germany at the time. But anyway, leaving that one aside, um, that was certainly the Nothing to do with the reason. Marshall Plan, to nothing to do with investments, Marshall nothing to do with just hard-working Germans by themselves. They, 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 could, they could have said, we don't want the Marshall Plan, we'll do it by ourselves because we'll work hard. We don't want the cuts in the uh, debt at all. No, of course the Marshall Plan, so, well, uh, the Marshall so, plan made a huge difference so in that particular way. So why is there a goose and not a goose and a gander thing? Is, is, the, uh, well, the problem again comes back to where, as we were saying, where, where is the money going to come from and where, where are the interest rates going to go to as a result afterwards? Maybe, I mean, just, just on this point about, the lady here mentioned uh, macho culture, which is a very good point. I mean, my objection to Angela Merkel's policies is it is a very macho, take the pain, take the pain, get on your knees, which is, which is actually hugely destructive to human dignity to come back macho. to the balcony. And I just, think, I just think, and I think, look, this point, about, this point about debt, you know, <laughs> we're hearing a lot about debt and morality and, you know, who do we, you know, everyone should pay the debt. Let's not forget the facts here. Merkel's policies are increasing the debt. Maybe you haven't looked at the statistics. Over the last three years, Italy's debt trajectory, Greece's debt trajectory, Spain's debt is on the up, not the down. That's why I'm saying austerity is not working. This idea, you know, Merkel and the Troika said in 2010 that if Greece does what we tell it to do, it will contract for, I think, 2.5% of GDP, and then it will recover. Three years later, it's contracted by 10 times that amount. How people can come here and defend a person whose predictions, whose policies have failed so miserably is beyond me. why is Spain economy picking up? Oh, everything's okay. picking up now. Spain, <laughs> this sorry? is like the British economy. This, what's Would picking, you like what's to your remind us about no, Spain, you mean 50 Spain youth unemployment has gone through up. huge efforts, tremendous suffering as well from the people, and it seems that it is picking up, and it's good news. Why should we say no to good news? Uh, well, I actually, mean, the EU forecast the for the Eurozone is not good news at all for the next year, right. actually, if you look at the European Commission. Right, I want to move this forward. Go ahead. My name is Jonah Wise, and I'm for the motion. And I have a question for Mr. Beaver. Your initial proposition was that the Euro was created upon uh, uncertainty um, on the part of France that they would uh, potentially face another attack by Germany. This is not the case. It was in fact a result of the Marshall Plan um, and America's will for a European Federation, a program, a program of fiscal stimulus. It is in fact basic macroeconomics that spending, 
supply side and demand side um, spending will result in growth and a reduction in debt as a country reaches the height of the, um, um, All right. the economic cycle. Anthony Beaver. Well, it's the first time I've heard that the um, euro was um, dreamed up at the um, Marshall Plan Conference. I mean, my, my father was part of the British delegation, and I'm, I don't, think, don't remember him ever mentioning that. But, I mean, the euro, I think, as most uh, commentators at the time recognized, uh, was very much that point when Mitterrand was um, deeply concerned about the unification of Germany. Um, he you know what he said? I love Germany so much, I'd rather have two. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, also, there's a story about Margaret Thatcher, about how um, he tried to persuade her, saying, Margaret, you know um, Gorbachev, you're the only person who can stop the unification of Germany. And she was very confused about this, and actually for once asked the Foreign Office what they thought. And well, we're talking about Angela Merkel tonight, not uh, oh, Margaret sorry. Thatcher. Oh, sorry, all right, okay, okay. But it is... Right at the back. Uh, Thank you. Go ahead, please. Which way are you thinking? Uh, my name's Lorna Walker. Um, I'm undecided, probably leaning towards the fort, but I've got a question for against. Um, is Angela Merkel destroying Europe? It's in the present tense. Could the against motion please give one action they think Angela Merkel should take now in the next couple of months that would improve Europe, not destroy it? Uh, as I mentioned, Merkel will get into a coalition government that will change the dynamics of uh, German policies. So I personally believe that the Grand Coalition, which is supported by a majority of Germans, will bring a better balance because the SPD insisting on the minimum wage will also inject more demand for internal consumption and that should, in a way, balance better the continental economies. Sorry. Also, some economists predict that German, Germany has had it very good for now, but that actually the forecast is not that good. Yeah. So, Christine, essentially, Merkel's best thing to do is to listen to critics of austerity, is what you're saying? No, Merkel you is are, a politician. The SPD she has won elections wage. for the third time. She's a perfectly legitimate democratic leader Obviously. supported by her citizens. She's also, but the policy as you she may do know, very well respected left -wing in Europe. To raise demand, and which she's is what this side of the very well respected in France. She's perceived as a serious politician, which in yes, other European countries some right. people envy. Let's get more voices, please. A lady uh, in the middle, please. Yes, you have the microphone. Hello, my name's Eleanor Jones and I'm for the motion. But I asked the opposition, we heard quite a few points of humanitarian, like this is a humanitarian crisis and it, was, it is undoubtable fact that the Marshall Plan put Germany ahead when I think we should do the same favor to Greece in the fact that it shouldn't be scorned by the banks and obviously overspending by the elite few when it's actually the people that are now going to suffer and I think Germany should have some humanitarian responsibility just like we showed it when, with the Marshall Plan, I feel that would be fairer. Christine, do you want to respond to that? There is indeed a great deal of humanitarian concern about Greece and other countries in Europe suffering from the crisis. Yeah, but we're not discussing humanitarian organizations. I no, but we were that discussing, was the question. Sorry, we're that discussing. was the question no, no, of you're this defending, young lady. You're, you're saying Europeans, a, a lot of Europeans have shown a lot of solidarity to, to Greece and to Spain and to Portugal, and, and everybody's grateful, and, they, and we think that that is part of the answer. The question is, is the imposition of austerity leading to the kind of politics and results that we saw in the 1930s. No, and neither of you have said anything about of our that. Young, uh, that young lady in the back. What she said about the Marshall Plan. Right, let's hear yeah, three, that's what she three, said. Three, three, right at the back and then the gentleman at the front. Yes, my name's Nick. I live in London. I was born in Australia. There is one way uh, that this could be solved and Germany could be paid back the euros that they're owed. And that is if Germany were to leave the euro. That way, the southern countries would devalue the euro, they would prosper with the devalued currency, and they would pay back Germany uh, what Germany was owed, albeit it wouldn't be quite worth what, um, uh, what Germany might be hoping for. And I'd like to ask that question to Anthony Beaver, given his superb knowledge uh, of history. 
Um, that is certainly, absolutely, that is certainly one solution. I mean, the, the idea, I don't think the Germany would like to do it on its own. I think the question of how Germany will deal with it in the future um, can, could be solved in that particular way, but the Germany would not like to leave the euro on its own. I think it would much more prefer to, say, have a northern euro with uh, Netherlands, perhaps, uh, Finland, and so forth, and maybe Lux. No, just it's financial markets which decide of the value of the euro. Yes. It's not any government. Mm. So the idea that a government would suddenly decide let's devalue the euro doesn't make sense. All right. It has been a fascinating debate, and uh, you've been voting. Let me remind you uh, how you voted before the debate. 29% of you did not know whether you had a view on Angela Merkel is destroying Europe. 53% of you were against that uh, when we started this debate. 18% were for uh, the uh, motion. The result is that um, at least 19% of you have come to a view. There are only 10% of you who are still undecided. But the vote is for the motion, 23%. Against the motion, 67%. That's up from 53%. So this side of the House has won. So the motion that uh, Angela Merkel is destroying Europe has been defeated by Christine uh, Ockrent and Anthony Beaver. And I have to tell you that your support for the motion has not succeeded. So thank you very much indeed for a very vibrant debate on this critical issue. Our thanks to the speakers, to you here in the Cadogan Hall in London, uh, and uh, my thanks as well to Intelligence Squared for making this possible. So from me, Nick Gowing, thank you to all of you for joining us. Bye-bye. <laughs>